hearing me through his mic uh, for the for the audience on the web. So one of the things that's most impressive about Joe's research is how versatile he is. He's published on cryptography to economics to everything in between. He recently completed uh, his PhD with uh, Ross Anderson at Cambridge focusing on authentication and after that he wanted to experience life outside of the ivory tower for a little bit so he's at Google New York now for a hopefully temporary stint and um, uh, Joe tends to make very good use of his time in the industry in my in my opinion not just for building products but also for advancing human knowledge when he was an intern at Yahoo Research he published a paper analyzing 70 million passwords which, uh, which is by far, correct me if I'm wrong, by far the lar largest uh, corpus of passwords ever analyzed. So if there's anyone who I trust to tell us about the future of passwords, it would probably be Joe. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. All right, take it away, Joe. All right, thanks, Arvind. Um, right, so uh, I guess that was pretty complete. I don't need to say anything more about myself. I'll try and stay in the bounds of the camera here. Um, right, so... Uh, I guess, I mean, I was told that this audience is a mix of people who are more interested in policy, more interested in, in tech and computer science. Um, my, my background is, is computer science and math and, and crypto, so uh, hopefully I'll, I'll have a couple of interesting technical things to say, but I'll also try and throw out uh, what I think are really the interesting questions. So um, I think I, I said looking forward 10 years or, or something like that in the, the talk abstract, not because I I have a crystal ball and I have uh, know exactly what's going to happen. I ho hopefully have a few predictions to make along the way. But I'll try to frame this more in terms of sort of looking back, what have we actually figured out in the previous 10 years? Because I think that that's, um, that's really helpful looking forward to think about what kind of uh, questions we might be able to successfully answer in the next uh, 10 years. And I'll, I'll try and just really pose what the big questions are around authentication as I see them. Um, so I, I've started with this for a while and I talk about authentication because I think it's uh, just fun. This is back a lot further than 10 years, 50 years. Um, this was actually the first computer system that ever used passwords. Uh, really the, the first one that ever bumped up against this problem of uh, authenticating humans to the um, computer that they're trying to use. Um, so last year uh, IEEE, uh, <coughs> Computer Society magazine, actually published an oral history of uh, CTSS, this uh, computer system, um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of it. And uh, it's actually quite long and, and very interesting, the whole thing, but they had a couple of really uh, good anecdotes about passwords. Probably the, the thing that was the most enlightening to me was that when they first started using passwords, um, there was only one threat model, and the threat model was people being able to use more quota and more resources on the system than the admins were, were intending for them to have. Um, and indeed, the, the first person who ever uh, at least claims to have guessed passwords successfully and used them um, was this guy called Alan Sher, who was a grad student in the 60s. And he says, yeah, I... Um, I guessed a couple of people's passwords and I was using logging into their accounts, but the only reason I did it is because I wanted more time to run my experiments because I wanted to graduate. Um, and uh, also there was the first uh, password breach in this system, not quite on the, the scale we've seen recently. Um, there was actually a race condition in the system that the print program would just print whatever file was most recently accessed and it would touch the file that uh, you meant to print, but if somebody else um, accessed a file before the printer actually printed, it would print that. So in uh, 1964, the thing finally happened where somebody logged in at exactly the right moment in between uh, somebody typing print and the printer actually querying which file was most recently pressed, and the entire file of everybody's password in the system got printed. Um, and this was before, uh, before the days of hashing passwords, so they were just printed in plain text. And the sysadmins, uh, there were, I mean, only a couple dozen users at the time, but they had to reset everybody's passwords. Um, so in a sense, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, and it's also um, maybe kind of telling that we really have these same, same problems today. Okay, um, so like I said, I'll, I'll try and give you uh, the 10-year the window backwards and forwards and just go over uh, from a bunch of different angles because, as Arvind said, I've uh, tried to do this in a um, 
not so much interdisciplinary, but just uh, looking at looking at it from a lot of different different uh, angles. So um, I'll start, uh, hopefully, I guess, with the most technical part and get progressively less technical as the, the talk goes on. So the, the question that I've actually spent by far the most time looking at in my, um, for my thesis work is just how we evaluate uh, some big set of passwords. Um, so why is this useful? For a lot of different reasons. Um, we'd like to be able to compare different populations of users if we have a sample of, of passwords that they've chosen. Maybe the, the users from two different websites. Uh, maybe it's two different demographic populations. Or to just be able to compare users over time. Um, or to be able to experiment if we can actually get users to pick better passwords. Um, so uh, what people have done for uh, a long time in, in academia when they've tried to write uh, papers about passwords, um, if they're, they're trying to evaluate how strong passwords are, they just look at things like how long the passwords are, uh, whether or not they contain digits or, or symbols or special characters. And uh, in 2006, NIST, um, this is actually in the appendix uh, of a document called the Electronic Authentication Guideline, um, something along those lines. Um, they published a formula that just adds up a couple of different factors, how long the password is, what kind of characters are included, and then just gives you a number for how uh, strong the password is supposed to be. Um, and they admitted that this is uh, very hand wavy. Um, it's it's ad hoc. Uh, it's just supposed to be a, a heuristic. But um, since this got published, um, really all of the password papers that have come out since uh, that have needed something have plugged in this formula. Really, I think until the last year or two, the the group at Carnegie Mellon, which has done a lot of research on passwords, has come up with an alternative system now, which I think is is definitely a, a little bit of an improvement. Um, but it still involves sort of counting lengths and stuff. The uh, more interesting approach, I think, is to just um, take the approach of uh, if I was an attacker and I had these passwords, how hard would my life be? So run some cracking software, see how many of the passwords you can actually guess. So this has been going on all the way since 1979. Um, great classic paper to, to dig up and read by Morris and Thompson, where they write the first password cracker. Um, and on and on, there's sort of been uh, a few waves of this. Like in the early 90s, a, a bunch more people got interested in it because of the, uh, the DARPA worm. Um, and uh, recently, there's sort of been a, a, wave, of, um, a wave of cracking uh, experiments, too. Um, so I, I did a meta study, uh, and I just um, tried to put all the data points of cracking experiments onto one plot and, and see what it would look like. Um, so this axis here is the. Uh, percent of passwords that were actually guessed. And this is the size of the dictionary that was used. And I plotted the dictionary size logarithmically. Um, I see head shakings. Confusion, or? No, it's, it's, it's just depressing. Oh, the, <laughs> the low size of the dictionary? Yeah. Or the sparseness of the data? No, no, the, um, the fact that the, you don't need such a large dictionary to get an awful lot of passwords. Yeah. It is a log, so um, it's base two. So this is about a million, and this is a billion here. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, a million used to be fairly big. Although you can see, even in even in 1979, they went up to a dictionary of about a billion. Although it's also interesting that they were able to get 90% of, of passwords then. They were limited to eight characters, and almost everybody only used uh, lowercase letters uh, in that study. Um, so for the most part, we really only have data on uh, cracking experiments that have um, broken about half of passwords or less. This is actually really, um, the 1979 paper was one of the only ones where they've broken like su substantially more than half of the passwords. Um, so this is uh, kind of nice. I mean, the, the, the problems with it are that you see huge, huge gaps. So. Um, in this 1990 study, it took uh, far less than a million passwords, uh, a, a dictionary of size a million, to break about 20% of users. And then um, in 2006, uh, which this was something that Bruce Schneier did for his blog, it took almost a, a billion um, guesses to, to get about the same percentage. Um, 
So it's a little bit hard to know how to interpret that. Have the passwords gotten much better? Um, is the cracking somehow worse? Or is the cracking better and passwords have gotten even more better than this indicates? Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to look at and, and draw too much that's, that's useful. So uh, the good news um, is that in the last couple of years, we've gotten so much data that for the most part, you don't even need to do cracking anymore. Um, you can just simulate an attacker who's perfect, who uses exactly the best dictionary possible, um, and you can figure out exactly how well that attacker would have done. Um, and that's what I've been able to do with this large data set I collected from Yahoo, and also a bunch of data sets that have leaked on the internet. So I've basically spent the last three years um, getting, collecting every password leak I could find and curating them. I have a big hard disk full of, uh, full of password leaks now. Um, and it's, uh, it's gotten nice, actually, because now uh, whenever one of these happens, it gets emailed to me by 10 separate people. So I used to have to go and look for them, and now they, they just find their way to me. Um, but anyway, uh, comparing it, um, you can see that actually uh, most of the results that we had from password cracking were in some sense uh, pessimistic, in that uh, a, real, a, a perfect attacker can actually do much better um, than, the, uh, than all the cracking attacks that were done. Now, of course, an attacker is never going to be quite perfect, but um, this, is, this is useful as a, a lower bound on security. Um, and you can see that with, uh, I mean, four different pretty big password leaks from, from different websites, from a blog, from two gaming websites, and from, from Yahoo, and, and Yahoo wasn't a leak. I should be very uh, careful to say that wasn't a password leak. Um, I'll, I'll get to where the data came from in a second, but this was uh, collected with permission. Um, but you can see that within, within about a bit, so a factor of two, um, they, uh, all of these distributions were about equally, equally strong. And they're all right, a, right around the point of to, um, to compromise half of users, you need to make about a million guesses. So that's basically just where we are. In, uh, where we are in the present day in terms of how strong passwords that people pick on the internet are. Um, this is the technical part which uh, I've chosen to skip. Um, skip for the most part when I give this talk, sometimes I go through this in, in 15 minutes. But I will say for uh, people who are uh, more mathematically inclined, um, this has been a, a big change, I think, in the last 10 years um, where we've uh, slowly started to stop thinking about evaluating a distribution of passwords in terms of entropy. Um, entropy gets used for, uh, I mean, it's the, the basis of information theory, and it has a lot of really great uses, but it, it fundamentally doesn't model guessing problems um, like we're interested in for passwords. Um, it sort of crept into the discussion about uh, passwords because cryptographers like to talk about entropy, but it's sort of always been philosophically wrong um, and there's a bunch of mathematical problems, too, like it's actually very difficult uh, to compute um, on empirical data. So we have uh, much better metrics now, which are more intuitive and, and easier to compute. Um, I know it looks like the formula is really complicated, but when I say easier to compute, I mean with a limited sample, you can estimate it more, uh, more accurately. So if you're interested in any of this stuff, um, there's a link to my paper. Sure. Um, no, uh, these were actually um, introduced slash uh, sort of refined by me. Um, the CMU, um, when I said that they'd introduced new metrics, that's for a slightly different problem. That's for uh, just looking at semantic information about a password, like how long it is, what kind of characters are in it, and assigning some sort of strength to that. Um, these metrics are all, um, make no assumptions about semantics or what any passwords mean. They only look at a probability distribution. Um, so, uh, which is one of the real strengths here is that I can compute these metrics when I get uh, leaked password data sets that are in Chinese or a, a language that I don't have to make any assumptions about. I only have to look at how frequent the most common passwords are in the data set, and then you can compute these metrics. Um, so so two, two very different problems. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm glad you brought, up, brought that up, so I should uh, make that point clear that these are sort of uh, 
two different ways of looking at passwords and assessing how strong they are, whether or not you want to make um, semantic assumptions like that. Um, I think fundamentally it's a lot better if you don't. If you have enough data and you can just analyze the passwords as a probability distribution and not have to worry about language and characters, um, that's uh, fundamentally you're, you're inferring something that's, that's more strong, I think. But if you have very little data, if you do, um, if you do a lab experiment and you get 30 users, um, you won't have anything that looks like a probability distribution. You'll just see all 30 users picked a different password, and that looks basically perfect. Um, so stuff like this doesn't make sense in that case. Okay. Um, and there's uh, also sort of a whole mess of math I could get into with these, uh, with estimating these distributions, with figuring out um, what the tail distribution looks like. So um, I don't want to go too far in, into the weeds here, but at a high level, what, what's interesting um, there's actually a very strong um, theoretical computer science results that are only about five years old now um, about estimating properties of distributions that you only learn about by sampling. Um, so passwords are, are, are basically an example of that. Even if you have uh, a, a leak of 100 million or a billion passwords, um, you won't get very many repeats for the rare passwords. So you're basically sampling from some distribution with a lot of really rare events. So uh, when I try and compute um, this metric, I, I showed one, uh, one slide ago, which um, the metric varies based on uh, how many, what percentage of passwords you assume the attacker is trying to break. Um, you can compute it uh, quite accurately for um, an attacker who's basically only going after the weakest passwords, because these are the passwords that you have the most information about. You have a very good sense of uh, what the frequency of those passwords is. Um, but for the tail of the distribution, for the unlikely stuff, the, the calculation is no longer accurate. And the easiest way to see that is if I just take one um, data set, which was these 70 million passwords from Yahoo, and then I make random subsamples of it. So if I take the 70 million and I subsample it down to, to 10 million or, or 500,000 passwords to simulate what a smaller leak would look like, um, you can see that uh, on this end that you can still compute accurately, and on the tail that the calculation now uh, is no longer, no longer accurate. Um, so what's really going on is that you fundamentally don't have uh, enough information here. And basically, we don't know. Um, the harder passwords in existence, we don't know what the, the shape of the distribution is. Um, and we don't know just because we don't have enough data, and we probably will never have enough data because the population of the planet isn't big enough. Um, philosophically, you would need a planet with uh, trillions or even quadrillions of people before you started having a really good sense statistically of how common passwords were in this region. Um, so, yeah. So, um, you didn't spend, you said you didn't want to spend too much time on the previous uh -huh. slide. Could you give us like a... Uh -huh. uh, a layman's explanation of the most important factor is your best estimate. It sounds like what you're describing is commonality of password rather yeah. than entropy. Is that accurate? Um, yeah, that's, well, I mean, so in a sense, entropy is based on commonality, right? Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, the, if, if you don't make any assumptions about the semantics of the password, then the only thing you have to go on is, is commonality, right? Um, how frequent the most most frequent ones are. Um, so that's that's all I'm uh, all I'm really claiming here. Um, yeah. Put it another way, the work measure is is like a, a measure of uh, what an attacker using the best possible guessing rule. How many guesses the best the attacker using the best possible guessing rule would have to make? Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, to to put it again. Um, the, the work factor is a perfect attacker, how much work would they have to do, and it's, it's on a logarithmic scale um, to break this uh, percentage of users. So it's, it's really quite simple, and the, the formula, I mean, this formula, it, it looks like there's a lot more going on than there actually is. It's, you can think of it almost like a, a coordinate transform and conversion to, to logarithmic and cleaning up a few other, other details which really aren't too interesting. Um, it's really just how many users you want to break, how much work you have to do. 
Um, and like I said, for um, the, the cracking experiments, we never had that much data on how much work you have to do to break substantially more than half of users. And even with the really big data set I got from Yahoo with 100 million passwords, and it was, it was funny because when, when I was setting up the experiment with Yahoo and I said, um, you know, I, I wanted 100 million passwords, they said, There's, that sounds like way too many. What could you possibly need that many for? And I said, no, even with, uh, even with 100 million, statistically, I'll be able to say, you know, quite accurately how much work you need to do to break 40% of users' passwords. But beyond that, the, the statistics break down. So it's kind of just an unfortunate statistics problem. Um, so what you can do, um, if you make some assumptions about what the distribution looks like, if you say maybe uh, password frequencies or some sort of power law distribution, you can project this. Um, and this is probably the part that's even better to skip. Um, but I'll just say that you can straighten these lines out a lot, and you can get um, somewhat consistent estimates, even with the randomly subsample distribution. So you can sort of deal with the sample size problem. Um, but, I mean, I should say that this is, this is very fraught. Uh, this is a really, really complicated model. Um, the, the people who have studied this problem a lot are actually uh, linguists, um, trying to model how, uh, how frequent different words are in, in different languages. Um, it's actually kind of a dead problem in linguistics. There's only a couple of linguists who are still working on it, um, mostly because everybody has given up thinking that it's impossible. Um, so, I mean, I'd like to say as a problem for the next 10 years, it would be great if we had a better model for what password distributions look like. Um, but I'm pretty pessimistic because the, the linguists have um, essentially concluded that, that this is a really hard linguistics problem that they don't think they can solve. And I think that passwords fundamentally are going to be much, much more complicated than language, just because they're sort of language plus a bunch of other stuff. OK, so I promise that this is probably the last equation for the whole talk. Um, so uh, I think what's, what's more interesting than the raw figures of how much work you have to do uh, estimating exactly you know, how strong these distributions are is to divide the distributions up between different types of users and, and compare them. Um, so we have a lot of data to do this. Uh, there's password leaks, like I mentioned, from RockU. So password leaks are great. You just get. Um, Passwords in plain text, you can you can count them up. If you're lucky, it's you know lucky from a research standpoint. They're in plain text. Sometimes they're hashed, but you know you can deal with that too. Um, or this uh, this Yahoo experiment I did, which I promised I would uh, show the details of. Um, again, this uh, the the details aren't aren't super important, but um, basically I went to Yahoo and said I want to collect a lot of passwords and be able to do this analysis on them. Um, and I want to do it in a, in a privacy-preserving way, so I don't want to see anybody's password ever. Um, obviously, Yahoo was, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't have been wise for them to agree to have an employee, especially an intern, have access to everybody's password. And of course, they don't store everybody's password in plain text. They store them hashed and, and salted. Um, so to do this, we had to actually uh, set up a special proxy server in front of the regular login servers that would see the stream of uh, clear text passwords coming in. So of course, Yahoo, like most internet companies, they do see people's password uh, in plain text, but only when you submit it to the, to the server. Then they check it, see if it's in the database, and then discard it. Um, so I had to do my experimental work all in front of that uh, process. And the way we did this, um, we had the, uh, this uh, proxy server that was doing the collection generate a, a random cryptographic key before the uh, experiment started um, so that it could then hash all the passwords it saw which, with this secret key. After the experiment was over, that key got destroyed. Um, the data I got was people's passwords hashed with uh, this key that was now gone, so it, it's not possible to reverse that hash without guessing the key. Um, and you know how, how it goes in cryptography, you just make the key big enough so that you assume it's not possible to guess. Um, but the really nice thing about this was that um, not only did I get this really big data set, which wasn't possible in leaks, but I was actually able, uh, every time I saw a password, to divide it up based on a bunch of uh, different categories. So basically, I, I collected different histograms um, for users of different types for 
you know, different, um, different languages, different countries that users came from, different products that they were using on, on Yahoo, different properties of their account. Um, I got all of that, that data, which had, had never really been collected before. So it was, uh, it was a neat experiment. Yeah. So now that the key is gone, did they let you keep the database? Because there doesn't seem to be much risk in that. Um, good question. Uh, they, I argued very strongly the initial proposal that was that I wanted to publish this corpus and have it be available for anybody to, to do research on. Um, and you're right that uh, you know if you if you believe in uh, cryptography and, and hash functions, there shouldn't be any risk from publishing this data. Um, Especially because all of these histograms had you know, at least 100,000 users in them, so uh, that there's really very little uh, risk to individuals. Um, the uh, the legal team at, at Yahoo did, just said no in the end. That's the the short of it. Um, and I you know I was disappointed for science. It would have been great to publish the data, but um, frankly, I mean, it was great that Yahoo agreed to do this at all. Um, I'd wanted to, to do this at a lot of different places who, who just said um, there wasn't enough benefit for them and the, the risk, especially with you know, bad publicity that sites have gotten around password leaks, just seemed too high. Um, so unfortunately, I, I haven't been able to publish the data like I would have liked. Yeah. It sounds like you're collecting a password every time somebody logs in. Every time somebody logs in. Mm -hmm. what, are you correct? Are you well? Are you correcting for a multiple login from the same account, or yeah. for or for failed login? Um, yeah. So I only collected uh, successful logins, um, and uh, right here I uh, I drew that. Yeah, I had a separate bloom filter of everybody I'd seen before, so people were only counted once. So yeah, it was a good question. Those are those are important details to to take care of. OK, so having done all that work, um, I can start drawing those plots like I had a few slides ago. This is maybe drawn a little bit too small, um, although it's, it's sort of on purpose to, to drive the point home that um, I was really excited to get all this data and compare these different groups and see these massive differences in, in password strength between different groups. And what I mostly found is that basically every group I collected was very similar to every other group which doesn't necessarily mean that they picked the same passwords, but they picked a distribution of passwords that, that was uh, statistically very similar. Um, so this is actually split up by age of users. Um, everybody is within, uh, well within a factor of two, so there just aren't huge differences between age groups. Um, the trend was actually in the opposite direction that we expected, that the older users actually had a better distribution of passwords than the younger users. It wasn't a really strong effect, though. Um, which was kind of the conclusion of almost everything was that nothing was a really strong effect. Why were you surprised that the older ones would have stronger? Um, I don't know. Maybe I bought into the digital native myth. Oh. Um, I mean, I, sometimes I've done this. Uh, I've done this talk before and not shown this slide and asked the audience what they expected, and usually, you know, two thirds or so think the younger users will have the stronger passwords. But I mean, there's there's a story to tell for the other side, which is that young people are you know more risk taking and don't care. Did you try to estimate whether the distributions are in fact basically the same, or are they different and just similar in characteristic? Yeah, uh, I did do that. Um, I'll I'll get to that in like two slides. Well, I can just tell you now actually that um, they are. For stuff like this, for age, they're they're very very similar. Like the the age groups actually did choose the same passwords with you know slightly differing percentages. Um, mostly all all the groups that I thought would choose different passwords, in fact, chose mostly the same passwords. Old men chose princess just as frequently as young girls. So I mean, there were. <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, princess is always in the top ten of these lists. Um, it probably wasn't exactly the same. There were definitely individual things that changed a lot, but uh, for the most part, they weren't very far apart. I mean, when I say they weren't very far apart, the experiment that I did was to say, if an attacker had uh, trained on, on one, set's, uh, one set of users' passwords and then was attacking another set, how much would they lose by that? 
So, for example, if, uh, you know, if the attacker was expecting male passwords and was actually dealing with female passwords, their efficiency goes down by like 10%. Um, so it's just not a, not a huge difference. Further break down the 13 to 24 age group, because that seems like it would really encompass a wide range from middle schoolers to grad students, with the middle schoolers, I would think, much more likely to pick a short and vulnerable password. Um, I think I had 13 to 18 and 18 to 24. Um, I was actually, I was limited there based on the data that I was able to get from, from Yahoo. Um, but uh, I believe 13 to 18 and 18 to 24 were almost identical. Um, but again, almost everything, the, the, the gaps weren't that big. Including, I think what's uh, more interesting, um, these, uh, Retail users were users who actually had a credit card registered. Um, so there was sort of a, a question going into this, uh, do users actually pick a better uh, set of passwords if they're more motivated? Um, and we tried to answer that with a bunch of natural experiments by trying to find groups of users that should have more motivation. So these would be you know, users who had a credit card registered, users who were uh, using Yahoo as their primary mail provider, um, versus users who are using Yahoo games or other things that you, you might think of as more frivolous. Um, and again, this was a very small difference, um, you know, less than a factor of two. The only real difference is that this very, very left side here, um, the things start to, to diverge a lot. And all that really means is that people who had credit cards, um, they successfully avoided the absolute weakest passwords, so they were less likely to choose the, the one, two, three, four, five, six style password. But basically the rest of the way they were, they were behaving the same. Um, and we tested this for a, a bunch of different traits that we thought would motivate people to behave more securely, and we didn't find anything that, that actually did. Um, which was uh, kind of surprising. The, the philosophical interpretation is that um, users, the the counter theory was that users choose weak passwords because they don't have any uh, motivation to choose strong passwords, um, which I don't think I'm, I'm ready to completely reject, but I can say I found, found no evidence for it because I didn't see that users did better if they had more motivation. Um, the only thing that really made a difference uh, was things that marked users who were sort of power users, so people who logged in from multiple different locations, um, people who actually actively changed their own password without being told to, those people were much stronger. Um, other, other things like people who used Yahoo a lot more frequently, who had a lot more data stored with the site, they were also stronger, uh, chose stronger passwords. Um, oh, and the, the one other thing that was interesting uh, when I did all this binning, um, Yahoo actually added a graphical password meter about two years ago. So I was able to look at users who'd signed up without the graphical meter telling them to choose a stronger password than those that did. Um, and that actually did make a difference. Uh, it, it improved security by about a bit, so about a, a factor of two, um, which isn't nothing. I mean, if you're making life twice as hard for an attacker, but it wasn't a sort of dramatic sea change uh, that, that I maybe would have hoped for. And uh, this question about how different, um, so this is probably impossible to read, but I can, I can give you the high level picture. Um, the question of how if users, you know, I'm saying that all these users picked a similar distribution, did they actually pick the same passwords? So the, the breakdown I thought would be the most telling would be users who spoke different languages. And the thinking is that different language groups should actually pick different passwords even if the distribution ends up looking the same. Um, and this was pretty amazing, um, but this didn't really hold true. There were a bunch of passwords that were very popular with every language group, um, so much so that uh, the, I tried to look at if an attacker trained on the wrong language, how much would their efficiency go down? And it was never more than a factor of five, um, which was kind of amazing. I mean, that was if, if the attacker had learned a dictionary of French passwords, and then went to attack Vietnamese users. That ended up being the worst pairing. I don't know why. Um, that was like a factor five loss of efficiency. I mean, which is definitely bad for an attacker, but it's, it's nowhere near what I probably would have guessed. And if an attacker just uses the globally optimal dictionary, the, the passwords that are popular everywhere, um, an efficiency only goes down by a factor of two. Um, so really pretty amazing that 
uh, all these different language groups essentially are choosing the same bad passwords. Was a character set constrained? Because I would imagine that if you had full range of Unicode, then it would have to be um, So it wasn't constrained, actually. Uh, Yahoo takes, uh, takes UTF-8 passwords, um, which is actually a really good lead into the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, which is why passwords don't internationalize. So this is this came um, really directly motivated by the fact that all these different language groups were, were choosing uh, choosing the same passwords. I was curious to see what was going on. Um, so I actually went and uh, I tried signing up for a bunch of different websites with um, passwords that weren't in ASCII that used um, you know UTF-8, um, and for the I guess for the um, non-technical audience, that's just, um, ASCII is basically the legacy um, set of just uh, A through Z, uppercase and lowercase, the digits, and a few punctuation characters. So in the 60s, this was basically all computers supported, um, and it's been being very slowly and painfully phased out by Unicode, which is a, you know, a new set that can represent all, it's designed to represent all characters that are used in any writing system. Um, but we found a lot of edge cases. So uh, if you try and actually submit a Russian password, this is an example online, um, the, because of a bunch of quirks in the way that uh, HTML works and the way that uh, forms get posted, the thing actually, um, it gets encoded twice. Um, so first, every letter gets replaced by a code. HTML does this. And then when you actually post the thing in a form, the whole thing gets percent encoded. Um, so this uh, six-character uh, Russian word for password turns actually into 78 bytes that get submitted, um, which leads to all sorts of fun bugs. So if you try and uh, use that password at IMDB, it tells you that it's too long. Um, so essentially, a lot of websites end up being unusable because um, they haven't planned for stuff like this. And beyond this, we actually found a lot of security vulnerabilities doing this. We found websites that were just replacing um, every character that wasn't ASCII with a question mark. Um, wow. So you could, you, know, you could register this password and everything would be fine, but the next day you could log in with six question marks and, and everything would also be fine. Um, so we found some of those. We actually found like a, a low-level bug that's in BSD and a bunch of other operating systems that had been there forever with not handling these things right. Um, so, you know, we, we filed the bugs, we got them fixed, but it was still, you know, strange to think that these bugs had existed for so long and no one had really uh, found them. So we sort of had to wait around, um, but we got lucky that uh, in the last year there was kind of this um, week where a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of Chinese hackers released lists of Chinese passwords, which is sort of what we were really waiting for. Um, I also randomly got uh, a smaller data set of uh, Hebrew passwords, um, or, I mean, passwords from a website that was in Hebrew. So when I actually looked at uh, what all the, um, what these passwords look like in different languages, and these are just uh, three distributions. The English one, I just used that big Roku uh, data set of, of 30 million passwords. The Chinese passwords came from a website called 70YX, which is kind of a gaming forum website in China, but it had 10 million users. Um, the, uh, I mean, the first thing was that none of the Chinese users ever used Chinese characters uh, in UTF-8. It was something like, I think it was five or six users out of 10 million had actually done this. I mean, it was, it was so small, it was you know, beyond words, basically. I'll, I'll, I'll get to why in a second. There's a very good reason for it. Um, so basically, the, the Chinese and the Hebrew users were using almost completely ASCII passwords. Um, I mean, the Hebrew users, uh, almost all of them had their name and all their contact info in Hebrew, um, but then they would type their password in ASCII. Including, we found that a lot of the Hebrew users were just switching their keyboard mapping to, uh, to English and then typing a word in Hebrew. So when we took... Um, Hebrew words like the word for password, and then we ran it through the reverse mapping, we found that ASCII string had been registered by a bunch of different people in the, in the data set. So we found some really strong evidence that, that users will do whatever it takes to, to, um, to register ASCII, because they've just been trained that that's the only thing that works. Um, so that's what they do. But a consequence of that, which is really interesting, 
is that if you look at the percentage of users who use digits in their passwords, um, so in English, the, the Rockview users, about 16% used all digits, and about half used a digit. Uh, the Chinese users, almost half of them used a password that was all digits. Um, and almost all of them used at least one digit. So there were just way more digits. Uh, the Chinese users were um, very strongly using numbers in their passwords, uh, which was, was pretty interesting. They were also, um, the Chinese users were much less likely to use uppercase. They were much less likely to use punctuation. So they're using a very limited set of ASCII. Um, they were also way more likely to choose passwords that were just some kind of trail on the keyboard, which I thought was interesting. But again, I guess uh, if you're if you're limited to, to using a character set that you're less familiar with, the strategy maybe makes sense. Um, so the the reason that you never see Chinese passwords is that um, there are two systems for typing Chinese, but the one that is uh, um, by far predominant now, especially among younger users, um, is uh, this graphical pinyin entry. So you actually enter um, pinyin, which is the, the Latin alphabet, um, and then you get uh, feedback that pops up and it says, did you mean this, this, or this? So um, if you've never seen this happen, it's basically like you're typing on your cell phone all the time if you're typing in Chinese. Um, but this just gets turned off for the password field. Um, so uh, you know what some people do is they just type in the pinyin that corresponds to the Chinese word that that they wanted, um, which we thought would would maybe explain the whole thing. But that was actually like less than thirty percent of users. Um, so basically, they they don't have a there's no convenient way to to enter a Chinese password besides copy and paste, which is why nobody does it. But I think that this is um, I've spoken to some UX people about the fact that passwords don't really work in other languages, which is sort of a problem that, that nobody really recognized until the last year or two. Um, like user experience. Um, maybe that's a, a Google-specific term, but I, I think of UI. Um, anyway, so hopefully, I mean, I've been posing this to a lot of people, hoping that it would spur something, but um, it would be really interesting to, to come up with a better solution for passwords for people whose uh, predominant language isn't you know, something that's typed in ASCII. What would the other 40% oh, that aren't using a string of numbers or a keyboard swap or, or, or straight pinion do it? Uh, there are actually a lot of people who are using English words, which is interesting. Um, and we were curious, maybe those were English speakers, but they had like registration info with a Chinese name. And then they use like password or there were a lot of them would type a brand name like Google or something simple. OK, so I think I'm going way too slowly through things I wanted to talk about. So I'll speed up a little bit. Um, I'll just say that you know one, one approach that we may see more of, which works better for international users, um, is these graphical schemes. Um, so these have sort of been an academic research topic for 10, 15 years now. And in the last couple of years, we're finally seeing like real big deployment. So um, for those of you who have an Android phone, you may recognize uh, this system. This came out of some, some academic work. And they have variations of it. Um, but it's been fairly successful in deployment for screen unlocking. And uh, on Windows 8 now, there's a a picture-based scheme where you have a picture and you can uh, swipe your finger across different points, um, do circles, and, and stuff like that. So um, where are these going to go in the next 10 years? Uh, I'd say it's not, not really clear. They seem to have found their niche sort of for unlocking phones. Um, I think that really we don't have enough data to compare these to passwords right now. Um, there's some evidence that users actually like them more. They're sort of more fun for people. Um, and certainly, they work better if you don't have a keyboard. The security is sort of a complete unknown right now. So hopefully, somebody will come along and collect a big data set, and we can look at how, how good these actually are. I mean, the, the one interesting security result is um, people looking at smudges on screens and figuring out that um, that seems to be the biggest weakness right now, is that you can spot where people's fingers have been. Future one just seems like there's a limited number of things that most people are going to do. They're going to do exactly that, like circle of face. Yeah. Like I can't picture my mother making some very complicated 
pattern, you know? I mean, yeah, so intuitively, I'm, I'm with you. And, you know, like, if people thought, I mean, in 1979, people said, you know, passwords are totally insecure. And it's taken a long time before we really had, you know, big statistics and numbers to back it up. So we just don't have that right now for the picture-based passwords. They seem maybe not great. But I think that, you know, that's definitely something that will happen in the next 10 years. It'll go the same route as passwords. There will be a lot of data collected and a lot of attacks. Okay, so uh, quickly, um, password cracking. Uh, something I've been less active in researching but been following. Um, password cracking has really grown up a lot in the last 10 years. Um, so the two big things have been rainbow tables, which are a really cool mathematical trick. They basically just let you store, um, they let you store a list of pre-computed password hashes in a very efficient form. So basically these are like a big multiplier where you can get a lot of people to do a computation once and then you can store it and, and pass it around. So you can go online right now, you can download a few hundred gigabytes that lets you instantly break uh, any password that's up to eight characters if it's hashed with you know, a specific hash function that, that's been pre-computed. Um, so those are about 10 years old now, and there's been refinements, but the, the basic idea has uh, been pretty dominant. Um, the other thing that's uh, taken off a lot in the last few years is that um, people have gotten into using fancier hardware to, to do the brute force. So people are using FPGAs. There's uh, some people who are actually selling FPGAs to do password cracking. Um, and there's been some kind of cool, exotic uh, academic papers on using uh, PlayStation 3, using graphics processors to, to do password cracking. Um, and now people are also starting to, to just pay for time on Amazon to do it. Uh, for my thesis, I collected a bunch of data points from uh, papers over the last 20 years of how fast people were password cracking and how much they paid to set it up. Um, and from 1991 to 2001, um, I calculated it was almost a 1,000 times speed up, which was really cool because if you believe in Moore's Law, which is a doubling every two years, that's exactly what you would predict, a 1,000 times speed up. And that was exactly what I calculated from uh, over, over a 20-year period. So obviously, I think that the hardware speed up will, will keep going into the future. Um, I think that we'll get you know more optimized hashing implementations and, and get better. Um, there's sort of you know there's one possible countermeasure to this, which is memory-based hash functions. Uh, so there's one that's sort of becoming a de facto standard now called S-Crypt. Not standard as in anybody really uses it, but just people always bring it up and say that that's the one that's already implemented, so, so people should try using it. I don't know of any big websites that have actually taken it on, um, but that's really the only, uh, the only way to slow down the, the speed of password cracking, because memory hasn't increased as fast yet. Like bcrypt, where you just set, I want this much work on, my, on each password. Yeah, so, um, I mean, iterated hashing is, is definitely smart, and everybody should do it. It doesn't really change the dynamics of the hardware race very much. It's sort of like a one-time win because, you know, you have to pay that cost on the server side, and the servers will get faster exactly uh, in lockstep with the, the crackers. So it's basically a, you know, once we invented that trick, that's a win of like a thousand times, but we, it, it won't continue to be a bigger win. So, yeah, unfortunately that's not a silver bullet. Um, there's also been, I guess, much more formal work. Uh, I mean, password cracking was sort of um, totally ad hoc throughout the 90s, and people have gotten more serious. There's, there's basically two mathematical models people have tried to use to bring this onto sound footing. Um, one of which is to use Markov models to model how, how passwords are made, um, which strangely has gotten way more publications than this uh, context-free grammar approach. Um, even though all the evaluations and contests, uh, basically everybody in the password cracking community uses the context for grammar approach because it just works dramatically better. But academics, I think Markov models are more interesting, so they still get, get written about all the time. Um, it's, it's a really strange quirk that I think you know, the, the people writing papers about this need to steer away from. The other thing I'd say about password cracking is that um, it's always sort of been 
you know, sort of a niche uh, interest. It hasn't ever been a huge academic subfield. In the last couple of years, they've started having these contests every year at DEF CON, um, which in some ways have been really good. I think it's gotten, there was this John the Ripper password cracking library that was, was really dominant. It was the, the, really the only open source one for a while. Um, a lot more people have sort of started publishing their library and gotten, pub, you know, uh, making public how they were uh, cracking passwords, partly as a result of this contest, which I think is great. Um, I do think, though, I'm, I'm worried that the contest has made password cracking into an end in and of itself. Um, so I've uh, blogged a lot about ways I think that they're sort of missing the chance to do science with these contests. Um, the, the biggest issue is that they've, uh, they've made them a contest of cracking speed and efficiency at the same time. So it's not really, uh, and in effect, people have focused less on efficiency and they've just focused on bringing more hardware to the contest, which is a little bit less interesting. So I've, I've been in touch with the people running the contest and I'd said, you know, this would be a lot more interesting if either you gave everybody exactly the same hardware resources or you gave them the same budget and said they had to build the best hardware they could for a certain budget. And they basically said, yeah, that makes sense scientifically, but it's a lot more fun to do it this way. Um, so they're going to sort of keep doing it because it produces a, a bigger spectacle. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, eventually they'll get a little bit bored of that format and, and try something new. All right. Um, I have a few more hand-wavy uh, topics I wanted to go over. Um, one, oh, okay, this is the one I did want to do ask the audience for because I haven't, I haven't done it yet. Um, how do people think passwords actually get compromised in, in practice? Uh, I've, I guess I've worked at, at Yahoo and Google now and I've consulted for a lot of different people who deploy passwords. Um, the hint I'll give is that uh, people, I haven't gotten the same answers from everybody, but I mean, just shout out, what are the, what are the actually big threats to passwords on the web today? I heard password recovery. Spoofing password recovery. Spoofing and password recovery. Man in the middle. Somebody said captcha. Long, slow, brute force attacks. Long, slow, brute force attacks. Inside <laughs> jobs. Inside jobs. OK. Um, I don't know if I heard anybody say what's like by far the number one, which is like malware compromised endpoints. Um, <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we see. I mean, yeah. we, see, we see where somebody somebody's password get compromised on another system and they use the same one 12 places. And... Yeah. So, um, like I said, I've, I've talked to a lot of people about this. There's basically no data that's been published about it, which I think is one of the biggest opportunities to have really useful research, is to actually look at um, how this gets done, possibly through honeypot accounts, possibly through like infiltrating the underground market for these things. Because basically we don't know anything right now except what, what people sort of talk about with, with sysadmins and people who run the big systems. And like I said, when I talk to those people, um, everybody basically agrees that people having malware on their uh, home computer is, is the biggest problem. And that's, you know, most passwords get key logged and stolen. There's this uh, kind of group of threats in the middle, which are phishing, password sniffing, which is, you know, on an open wireless point or a network man in the middle. And then compromise from reuse, where people reuse the same password at different sites and they get, you know, reused. Um, there's no real consensus about how these stack. I've heard different opinions from different people. If there's consensus, it's that phishing is sort of on the downcline, the, the downslide. We've got a little bit better handle on it. And that uh, password compromise from, you know, reuse across sites seems to be going up. Um, but I'm not even comfortable saying how I think that these three rank. I am comfortable saying that I think passwords actually being guessed is still distant fifth place at best. So in a way, you know, everything I talked about with password strength and cracking up to this point is, you know, I guess it's important to, to, to frame it that this is not the biggest threat that's out there right now. Going through the inconvenience of always logging in with your password and username by storing it on a thumb drive. So there's no keyboard lock. Just copy and paste. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, it's hard to get that to work with every site that you go to. It's probably the biggest issue. 
I mean, I think password managers in general are, are great, but they're like a little rough around the edges. Your endpoint is compromised. Does it really matter? Is it not drive or not? Not unless the site that you're connecting to supports some kind of challenge response, so no. And, and I've been to sites that have actually put in JavaScript and whatnot, so you can't even paste in a password into the password field. So you, could, you couldn't keep a really strong one cut and paste it in. You have to type it. So we've only got two minutes left. Okay. So. All right. Well, I'll just phrase the rest of this in terms of what I think the big questions are. I'll try and give less opinion here, which is probably good since I've done less research here anyway. Um, I think what advice we tell users to help them to give to, to create better passwords, we still don't have a really good handle on this. Um, this advice to take a sentence and then compress it with the first letters, um, that came out of, uh, I mean, actually a lab study that was done at the University of Cambridge in 2001. It hasn't really held up. Um, I've looked a little bit, and there have been a few other papers that, about how strong these passwords are. Um, they're not great. It's very possible to guess these as well. Uh, when, this, when this advice came out, which was actually by Google before I worked for Google, um, I blogged and said that this actually wasn't great advice. This password is actually exactly average. Um, if you look at, uh, I looked at how common it was in a bunch of data sets, and actually a lot of people picked this exact password by taking the Hamlet quote and compressing it. Um, so the evidence is this is not the way to pick a really great password. And we, we don't really know. Um, is there a way to do this with these graphical meters? Again, I'd say we don't really know. The research has been that they improve things a little bit. Users definitely spend more time, and they try and do something that makes the meter green. But in terms of if the passwords are actually harder to guess, that's, uh, we don't really have strong evidence for that. Um, so my personal thing that I think is a really cool area for research is to, to look more at what we know about memory, um, which isn't, I mean, we know a lot about the low-level physics of neurons and how memory works, but not the, the higher-level stuff. But there is a whole community of people who compete, and they have these memory championships, and they've learned a few useful things. The main thing I think that we're sort of missing on passwords is that you memorize through repetition. Um, and most password schemes assume that the password has to be memorized instantly. Uh, so what I've started doing, and I'm hoping could, could grow into something more useful eventually, um, I memorize my password. I, I choose pretty long random passwords that are like in the 15, 20 digit range, which sounds really, really long. If you have to memorize 20 digits at once, it's impossible. But I'll memorize like the first 10 on the first day. And I'll keep the suffix of it in my pocket, and I'll slowly tear off digits as I have them memorized. And after two weeks, 20 digits is nothing. If you do it by spaced repetition, you, you can actually memorize a lot of stuff. Um, I guess I'll skip this for lack of time and just uh, say that um, I did a big study of how passwords get deployed in practice. Um, the biggest finding was that. Uh, very few sites actually do this right. A lot of them make really basic mistakes. They don't encrypt passwords. They don't hash. Um, they don't prevent you from uh, brute forcing the password online, all that kind of stuff. Um, the only people who did a really good job had a lot of traffic. Um, they were all the usual suspects you've heard of, so Facebook, Google, Microsoft, eBay. IKEA was, was a very random one. Um, so uh, I've also done a lot of work looking at what will replace passwords. Um, if you're interested in password replacement schemes, we have this kind of whole paper where we tried to come up with a really comprehensive framework. Um, the conclusion is basically that no single thing really replaces passwords conveniently on their own. There's no simple drop-in replacement. Uh, everything is better and worse. So. Um, you know, this paper, in some sense, was kind of uh, a null result that, you know, nothing we looked at was really dramatically better or worse than passwords across the board. Um, but our goal here was really just to encourage people to look at how broad and, and deep the problem is. And it has been, been cool that since we published this paper, a couple of people have published follow-ons, and they've tried to evaluate their proposal for replacing passwords against all the criteria that we laid out. Um, so I'll tell you in, in two steps what I think will replace passwords in the long run, what's sort of going on right now. Um, 
some sort of federated authentication, which is a, a total mess right now. Um, so the OpenID community has become really fragmented. There's a bunch of different versions of the spec. Um, they're, again, trying to totally rework it into something called OpenID Connect. And I think it's great, and there's really smart people working on it. Um, but essentially, it's gotten so complicated right now that it doesn't matter what the spec says anymore. Uh, sites and sites that actually accept federated authentication, they just do a different implementation for the few providers that they're willing to accept. So they accept Facebook's version of it, they accept a couple other people's version of it, and that's sort of it. The dream of having an open system looks a little bit shaky right now. But I think there's some precedent from like the EMV uh, payment protocol, which is another protocol that was supposed to be one true protocol for all payment providers. And in the end, people just accept sort of the, the Visa and the MasterCard version of it. So I think that'll happen here. I think that there will be federated authentication. I think people will just only be able to support a limited number of uh, providers. But I think that there's only a limited number of providers that have the weight to really push on this, too. So Facebook's been the only player that's really been successful in getting people to accept their federated scheme. And that's because they have uh, a really nice carrot, which is they have all this user data to give out. So once we have federated authentication, you still have to authenticate to your identity provider. Um, how are we going to do that? Uh, I think passwords are kind of always going to be with us. And I think we'll just add a bunch of extra pieces as we go. I don't think that we're going to stop using passwords and start using biometrics or any other single scheme. Um, looking at what's going on from at, at Google and, and Yahoo and the other big players I've talked to, um, Authenticating users is just a machine learning problem now. So you have passwords, that's great. The password may get compromised in a ton of different ways. But you have a lot of other signals to try and figure out if you're talking to the same user who registered the account. You can look at their browser, their IP address. Um, you can look at sort of the time and pattern of stuff they're doing. Google is now adding in second factor authentication with phones. There's a proposal to do this uh, certificate-based thing in your browser so that you can authenticate browsers much more strongly. Um, so these are all great, but at the end of the day, it's just a, just a machine learning problem. And I think that the big, the big players have actually been you know, behind the scenes, not worrying about passwords too much for quite a few years now, and just figuring that they'll, they'll build a smart layer of machine learning. They'll detect you know, the most egregious cases of fraud They'll stop most password compromise that's you know, done by large-scale internet attackers. And the world will sort of go on that way. So the conclusion from those last two things I told you, which is that basically only the big players really have uh, are going to be supported for federated authentication. And they're also really the only ones who have enough data to uh, do the machine learning well and actually get passwords to sort of work. Uh, I think over the next 10 years, we're really going to see um, authentication and identity providers be, uh, have a very few number of players that are able to survive. I think um, you know Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Microsoft, they have a lot of users. They have some experience. They'll be able to, to do this and keep going. Um, I think a lot of other people collecting passwords will eventually be replaced by the few big players. And there'll be you know, some different ones in different countries. Um, there's, you know, this is just my prediction that there's only going to be a few people in the password business 10 years from now. It might not be these people. It might be the payment people. I've heard people say that it won't be, you know, the current webmail and social media providers. It will be Square and Amazon and PayPal and the people who do finance right now. I'm less skeptical. I think the fact that, uh, you know, Google and Facebook have so much personal data about you that can be used for authentication. I think that, that that gives them a huge head start. And again, I should be very clear that uh, this is in no way, you know, because I work for Google, uh, an official endorsement of uh, Google strategy or anything like that. That's just, you know, my opinion as I've been, been pitching it the last year. Okay, so uh, my thesis has, you know, links to most of the stuff I'm talk I've talked about. This is my more up-to-date email, so uh, please get in touch if you have thoughts about any of this stuff.